Finally, yeah, very nice to have you here um, at uh, the start, the kickoff of our AI and I series um, of events here in Berlin at the Soho House. And you were one of the contributors to our report on entering a new era, the impact of AI on society and economy. And um, one thing you said in the interview with Alexander Gerlach was that between humans and machine, there will be a peaceful cohabitation. That's quite an optimistic vision, I think. And could you please explain why exactly you, what you mean by that? Yes, well, thank you, first of all, and good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, yes, that's my vision, and it is what drives me to be a researcher in AI for so many years now, uh, because I do believe in the synergy that we can find between what we are good at and what machines and algorithms are good at. And what I truly believe that we should aim for is identifying this sweet spot where humans can exercise their skills and their uniqueness, whereas machines can also exercise you know, their skills and their uniqueness. Um, and the most uh, sort of like easy um, way to understand it is machines are way better than humans in storing information and in analyzing large scale uh, data. Uh, today, we wouldn't be able to analyze all the data we have without the help of algorithms, right? But machines are probably not very good in um, uh, finding associations between concepts, in getting the big picture, in adding context, contextualizing you know, the data or the results that you're getting, uh, of course, in uh, sort of like adding common sense that you know, we humans have. And that's why I think that the value will come when we are able to uh, identify this synergy and when we are able to leverage machines in whatever they're good at. And when I say machines, I don't mean robots, I mainly mean algorithms, because we have to understand that artificial intelligence today is vastly invisible. Uh, it's mainly software that is running basically in all the systems that we use. Um, but in many situations, uh, being able to have the human in the loop and having the human uh, make the ultimate decisions, for example. Uh, this is not only my vision, there are uh, other, many other experts that have this vision. Uh, for example, at MIT, uh, Professor Sandy Penla, my PhD advisor, uh, they have an initiative now called the Human Machine Intelligence, I think is the name, where the idea is the same. And I think a lot of the experts in AI, we share the same vision. Okay, great. So you are a researcher or director of research in data science at Vodafone. So big data definitely is the foundation for, for artificial intelligence. I think this is common sense now. But let's, let's be concrete now. You're working on some amazing projects for Vodafone to leverage big data for social good. Could you please explain us a little bit how you do this? Yes. Uh, so the relationship between big data and AI is mainly between big data and an area of AI uh, called statistical machine learning, which is the area that has experienced this exponential growth and impact since big data exists, because it requires large amounts of data to be able to train very complex models. Most of, most of the models today for pattern recognition tasks are what are called deep learning models that could have million, millions of millions, so American billions of parameters, for example. So in that context, uh, Vodafone, as a telecommunications company, one of its biggest assets is actually data. Uh, data coming from all sorts of uh, systems. It could be data uh, generated by humans coming, for example, from the mobile network uh, infrastructure, or, or it could be also data generated by machines. We are talking about the Internet of Things, about adding uh, connectivity to potentially 50 uh, billion of devices by 2020, and all those devices, many of them have sensors and are also generating data. So all this data is completely unthinkable and impossible to make sense of it by manual means. We don't have enough humans on the planet to be able to actually make sense of this data, so we need to rely on algorithms. So an area that I have been working on for the past almost 10 years now is the area of asking ourselves how can we help make better decisions in the world? How can we help actually achieve the sustainable development goals? How can we help have positive impact in the world thanks to the existence of all this data? For all projects, not only for this project, we have uh, some basic principles, one of them being uh, privacy by design and another one being explicit consent and informed consent, which of course today with GDPR, you know, are part of like every, every service. So um, for the projects on big data for social good, we are mainly talking about large scale aggregated and anonymized data. And the areas of impact are many. 
Um, we uh, have shown, not just us, but other research teams, that this data is valuable for public health, uh, particularly for infectious diseases and pandemics, because an infectious disease that is transmitted from a human to another human or from a human to another human through a vector, for example, a mosquito like malaria or dengue, dengue or, or Zika, uh, such a disease doesn't become a pandemic if people don't move. If I have the flu and I stay in my house, I don't cause a flu pandemic. But if I have the flu and I come to Berlin and I kiss you and I talk to you, then I go somewhere else, then suddenly you know, I can have a pandemic. So understanding human mobility is very important to understand how infectious disease might spread. And some of the data that we have as a telco is actually data about human mobility. So we are finding that we can really contribute to having more accurate uh, epidemiological models thanks to the existence of this data. Another area where we can have impact is on transportation, which is also related to mobility. And there are examples with the Wells Transportation Agency, for example, of building accurate models of traffic and even uh, CO2 uh, emission predictions by analyzing this data. Another area where uh, in the past, I've done projects and I'm trying to do some projects now in Africa is the area of uh, financial inclusion and uh, economic development. So we are finding that this data is also is a proxy of the socioeconomic status of a region, which is very important in developing economies, because usually it's a proxy to access to education, to healthcare, to drinking water. But also we are investigating how the mobile phones are an element for financial inclusion and how we can help accelerate that and you know Vodafone owns M-Pesa, which is the leading service in developing economies for uh, transferring money using feature phones and SMS. So we are trying to see how we can help um, include more people uh, into the financial system using this type of technology through the analysis of, uh, of uh, large scale data. These are just some examples. <laughs> Yeah, they are great examples, absolutely. Um, so if we, this, this is about algorithm, it's, it's um, kind of making use of big data, basically. Um, but there are often examples given um, of direct collaboration with humans and machine, like we've got this um, examples of care robots and yes. so on. Um, and if we talk, if you talk about peaceful cohabitation, so can you potentially give some examples what you foresee for the near future, how machines and people can work together? Yes, so I think in that front, I think there are different um, scenarios and use cases. So if the technology has an embodiment, if it actually has a physical body, it means if it is a robot, then we have the area called human-robot interaction. So there you definitely need a peaceful cohabitation because we are going to be interacting either for caring purposes or for social purposes or in an industrial setting for you know manufacturing or you know manipulating different industrial processes we're going to have to be collaborating with with robots so i think that's the most obvious probably way to see how we can collaborate right you're not going to have i don't know a, you're an elderly person you want to age at home because we know that when you age at home, your quality of life is higher, but you live alone, you know, you need someone to monitor, you know, your vital signs, to make phone calls if you cannot make phone calls, you know, to check that you're okay, probably it's going to be a robot, so you need to make sure that that robot actually can have a peaceful cohabitation with the, with the person, you know, that the robot lives with. But then, the, perhaps the more subtle, less intuitive way is when the AI system doesn't have a body meaning it's a software system, you know, it's algorithms. And I would say one of the areas of uh, greatest potential and impact is in healthcare. Uh, there is a concept of precision medicine, which is medicine that is uh, personalized, predictive, and preventative. And that vision for having a medicine that is not generalistic, that is not based on the statistics, but is based on you, and your particular characteristics can only happen thanks to the existence of AI because we need to understand your DNA and we need to see what makes you special. So that collaboration and the achievement of a personalized you know, medical uh, approach or personalized treatments or personalized diagnostics uh, is only going to happen when there is a collaboration between the algorithms and the doctors because at the end of the day, I think for such important decisions probably we want a human in the loop and we want the human to uh, have the ultimate you know, word. Uh, so I think there are many use cases where we need to process large amounts of information for the use case, be it healthcare, be it in finance, be it in the law even, you know, analyzing all the 
uh, jurisprudence and all the previous cases, uh, being in education and analyzing all the like previous performances for students. So we need to rely on algorithms to be able to digest all that information. But at the end of the day, we have to have the human in the loop to be able to take other sources of information and to be able to make the decisions. Yeah, that's why often I think um, the industry starts to explain what they want to do as augmented intelligence, yes, right? Exactly. Because it's the interaction of um, exactly. men and and That's another machines. of the terms that is used, yeah, augmenting the human capabilities as opposed to replacing the human capabilities. Yeah. And, and this is worth why, because there are deep concerns on actually, it's not just about the potential of, of AI, which we are discussing currently in Europe, it's uh, also the concerns um, how it will potentially turn um, societies upside down, right? So in particular, when it comes to the disruption of the labor market, actually, this is where politicians, but also individuals um, uh, care a lot about. Um, what's your take? Will the majority of Europeans lose their jobs to algorithms and robots sooner or later? So that's a very good question. I, I personally don't have the answer. I'm not sure anyone has the answer, but I can tell you my personal you know, opinion about this based on, on what I know and also what I've read. I'm not an expert on the economy or on the labor market. I think AI, like any other disruptive technology, is going to affect and it is affecting the labor market. This has happened in the past, you know, when we invented electricity, you know, when we invented, you know, cars. I mean, every sort of like disruptive technology has uh, meant the elimination of some jobs and the appearance of some other jobs. So in the context of AI, I think it's going to be the same. I think there will be a lot of jobs that will be affected by the sort of like pervasive deployment, you know, of AI systems, but there will be many, many more new jobs that will appear. In fact, today we are talking about having hundreds of thousands of experts in AI, machine learning, data analytics that don't exist because we don't have enough young people actually studying what is needed to be able to do those jobs. So there's actually a big gap right now in terms of skills. So how do we deal when we know that there's going to be such a disruption? I think for me, a key um, word is education. I think we need to invest in education at all levels. I think we need to really seriously think our primary school, secondary school education curricula and think about the present and even more so the future that we, that we will live in and ask ourselves, are we giving the new generations the tools that they need to be competitive in that world? And I would say in most cases, for most countries, the answer is no. I think most children are not getting a very strong, on the one hand, computational thinking education curriculum, which is key, which is not teaching programming and it's not putting a tablet in the room, in the classroom, it's about teaching you know, algorithms, data, computers, programming, networks, it has a lot of different like um, core competences. But we also need to uh, uh, reinforce a lot abilities in the social, emotional and creative intelligences that I don't think we are actually reinforcing today either. Then we have to think about professionals. All professionals, and particularly professionals whose professions are going to be affected by AI, are we giving all these people the opportunity to learn new skills so they can continue being relevant in the new reality that is going to happen? And we know that is going to happen. So there's a huge amount of investment that needs to happen in educating professionals. And then thirdly, I think we need to educate the general public. And that's why I'm so excited about you know, this publication and the Vodafone Institute you know, as a think tank and all the work that you do on outreach and on engaging with all the different stakeholders in society, because I think it's key. We are not gonna be able to make informed decisions as a society about a technology that we don't understand. And I can tell you that the vast majority of the civic society has a very superficial, if any, understanding of the technologies that we are talking about. That, are, that they use in their daily lives, because everyone has a smartphone, or almost everyone has a smartphone, and the smartphone services, they're all based on AI. Uh, but somehow they don't understand that what is powering all these services that they use is actually AI. Um, so I think we need to invest in those three levels of education if we wanna remain competitive, and we also want to give people the opportunity that they deserve to continue being relevant in the society. Great, lots of, lots of work to do here. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> last but not least, this is gonna be a question which we are asking all of our experts um, today on stage. Um, some of the brightest minds in tech have warned repeatedly that we uh, need to prevent singularity. So what do you think? Will machines be ruling the world in 10, 15 or 100 years? I mean, I, on the one hand, you could say they rule the world today. So uh, I, I, I mean, personally, and I think this refers to the first question, my vision is more on the 
peaceful co cohabitation, probably because I think it's probably the only chances that we have to actually survive as a species, right? Um, so the concept of singularity is very controversial. Uh, it is uh, based on predicting based on past trends, you know, uh, future trends. But of course, um, you know, we know that silicon has limitations. There is advances happening in other areas of computation, like quantum computing. I mean, I think there is certain unknowns, you know, that we don't know. But I think today we are underestimating the vast amount of decisions that are already delegated to algorithms. And we are underestimating the vast amount of our daily behaviors that are mediated by algorithms. And to me, that's more interesting and more important to think about and discuss that whatever might happen in 50 years or in 20 years, because it is happening today, and I don't think the people are aware of it. I mean, the news you read, the books you, you know, you're recommended, the movies you're recommended, the music you listen to, the friends updates that you see, you know, all of this is right now being recommended by algorithms. And you know, one of the areas in this particular area of personalization and recommendations is the challenge of the diversity of the recommendations. Because what we are finding is that algorithms tend to put you into some box. You know, Inger really likes whatever, horror movies, and then they just recommend you horror movies. I mean, I don't know if this is the case, because the algorithm is like, oh, I'm so smart, you know, she only watches horror movies. And precisely, we realize that we actually, we want the opposite. We probably want algorithms to inject diversity in the recommendations, so you are exposed to something different from your stereotype. Uh, in terms of news, you are exposed to news that you don't necessarily agree with, but that actually show you that in the world, there are different ways to interpret reality and different ways to view the world, right? And if we only interact with systems that only show us what we like, we are not fostering um, a society where people have an open mind. We're actually fostering the opposite. So, and this is happening today. So for me, I think it's more interesting to think about you know, what is happening today, what are the challenges in the systems today, where we want to go, what we want to achieve, and what we need to do to be able to get there more than perhaps thinking, okay, are machines you know, in 50 years going to you know, overcome us? Because I think the, the impact, it is already happening today, but I don't think there is a public awareness of the amount of impact that is already happening. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Inger, this was great. Thank you. Thank you.